From the food we eat, the air we breathe, the land we dwell, to the health of our body and mind, and the well-being of all things in the universe. Unlock the science with Chula Radio Plus. Welcome to Unlock the Science. I'm Virada Salim. The sun is the primary source of energy for our planet. It brightens our days, gives us warmth, and most importantly of all, it provides light energy for plants and algae to perform photosynthesis, which creates the fundamental food source for almost every biome and generates oxygen for every living organism. It is an understatement to say that our lives depend on the sun's energy. As without the light and heat from the sun, it is certain that life on Earth would be impossible. Powered by the nuclear fusion reactions in its core, the sun radiates energy mainly as visible light, ultraviolet light, and infrared radiation. Though the sun is about 150 million kilometers away from the Earth. Study and measurement of solar irradiance have revealed that our world receives significant amount of solar energy from the sun. According to the United States National Aeronautics and Space Administration, or NASA, the measurements made by the most recent NASA satellite missions gauged that the intensity of solar energy reaching the top of the Earth's atmosphere is about 1,360 watts per square meter. If we could capture and reuse all the solar energy arriving over a single square meter, the energy from only one hour of solar radiation can fully charge up to 250 iPhones. However, not all the energy from the sun is absorbed. According to NASA, about 29% of the solar energy that arrives at the top of the atmosphere is reflected back to space by clouds, atmospheric particles, or bright ground surfaces like sea ice and snow. Another 23% of incoming solar energy is absorbed in the atmosphere, and the last 48% passes through the atmosphere and is absorbed by the Earth's surface. It is estimated that the total solar energy absorbed by the Earth's atmosphere, oceans, and land masses is approximately over 3.8 million extrajoules per year. In order to make sense of such significant amount of energy, the annual primary energy consumption of the world is just around 539 exajoules. It is as glaring as sunlight that solar energy is the largest untapped source of energy, which can be used to solve many of our energy problems as well as to power our ambitious energy-intensive projects in the future. We are currently facing growing threats from climate change as the rising of global temperature is contributing to more frequent weather extremes, increasingly powerful disasters, and worrying ecological degeneration throughout the globe. According to the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change of the United Nations, or IPCC, the primary cause of global warming is emissions of greenhouse gases from human activities, especially from the burning of fossil fuels such as coal, oil, and gas for energy. It was estimated that the intensive uses of fossil fuels as a main source of energy since the Industrial Revolution in the 19th century has been responsible for approximately 1.1 degrees Celsius warming. Climate scientists agreed that the only way to save the world from climate catastrophe is to keep the world's temperature well below 1.5 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels. This is because for every degree that the world is getting hotter, the more extreme climate disasters are going to become. As the lives and well-being of millions of people around the world are at stake, Facing away fossil fuels and replacing them with clean, renewable energy is undoubtedly our foremost priority that we need to do. Luckily, there is a solution for this challenge right over the sky, as every day when the sun rises, it provides us with seemingly unlimited, free, and clean energy. According to a study by Carbon Tracker, a London-based independent financial think tank that carries out in-depth analysis on the impact of energy transition. It was found that even with conservative estimation, 
we can harness up to 7,000 petawatts hours from solar energy, much more than enough to meet the entire global energy demand. To see how much these 7,000 petawatt hours is, let's look at some of our global energy demands. In 2019, the total global demand for electricity was only 27 petawatt hours, a tiny fraction of what the sun could provide us. Even though solar energy clearly has the potential to be our new primary source of power, the global electricity supply generated from the solar as of 2019 was just 0.7 petawatt hours, or only 0.01% of our solar potential. Up next, a doctor science reporter, Prat Rujiwanarom, talks to Thira Pong Sang Labjarengit, Urban Revolution Coordinator of Greenpeace Thailand, about the challenges and opportunity of solar energy. How do we turn sunlight into energy? Could you please explain us, please? How do we turn sunlight into energy? Uh, for the technology, technology available to us right now, we, are, we now have a solar panel that uh, turn or we can call it solar cell to turn the sunlight directly to the energy. And uh, the principle behind this technology that is that the solar panel is cons- consists of uh, two layers that uh, react to the sunlight differently. And when it uh, receives the sunlight, uh, the electron on, on one, one layer will, will release and, uh, and that release electron will become the electricity that we can use. And why solar energy is called among uh, renewable energy that uh, very essential for pushing the zero goal? For your question, uh, how solar energy is counted, counted among us renewable energy, right? Yeah. Uh, uh, for the carbon emission, we, we now Right now, we know that we cannot count it. Or we cannot count on the fossil fuel anymore. So only uh, renewable is our choice. And uh, in Thailand, uh, we have really strong sunlight, really strong that uh, can. I think uh, every people in Thailand already uh, feel this by themselves. Yeah. In Thailand, we have about like uh, four to five hours of sunlight per day. It's actually a lot compared to uh, other places in the world. And because of uh, our uh, latitude, Mm -hmm. uh, we have the solar energy in Thailand has a really high potential, Mm -hmm. high capacity for generate electricity. Mm -hmm. And uh, second thing is that uh, sunlight is available to everyone, Mm -hmm. no matter how you are large scale uh, electric plant or small scale farmer who just want uh, want to use the water pump for their own farm. Yes. Mm-hmm. Solar energy is also available for the small scale as well. And the technology and innovation uh, in this field are developing. The, the more invention uh, going to market right now and will be available more and more to everyone. So this is why uh, the solar energy is uh, our future for us right now. So the bottom line is uh, solar energy uh, do not emit the carbon into the atmosphere. So it is good sort of yes. to use. Is that yes. Correct? Yes. And uh, Th- Thailand has a really large uh, capacity for uh, solar energy. And how is the current situation on solar energy investment in Thailand? Uh, in Thailand, uh, for, for last scale, we have about 3,000 megawatts from solar energy right now in, in, the, in our grid compared to a uh, total 36,000 megawatts of uh, electricity that generate and used in Thailand like right now. So quite really small, like a uh, really fair percent. Mm-hmm. Yeah, less than 10% for, for our total energy produce, production and consumption. But for a consumer level, we we, we not have exact number of how many people, how many small households is already the, uh, installed the solar panel. But 
right now in terms of worthy net, in terms of return of investment, small scale solar panel, I think it's quite compatible right now. And uh, and normally people can get the whole investment for, uh, of the solar panel in five years. I mean, a break even point for in, a solar investment for small household is five years in Thailand right now. It means that a return on investment is uh, 20% per year. It's, it's really high compared to other investment options. So we can say that there, there is a lot of potential to expand the uh, solar energy investment in Thailand. Is that correct? Yes, especially in, uh, in the small scale, household scale, the consumer scale. Okay. And what, what are the challenges that Thailand is now facing in the term of solar energy investment? For individuals like us, mm-hmm. I think uh, challenges or key barrier is for, for uh, people to in, install, so, for invest in solar panel in Thailand for small scale. Like they have really complicated permit required for small household to install solar panel and no policy to support. And for the last scale investment, uh, the PDP, the Power Development Plan of Thailand. If uh, the PDP don't give priority to the solar energy, then the it is hard for energy companies for actually for anyone to start the solar energy investment because the we have to all investment all the energy that accept to the grid to the system have to comply with this PDP. From the current power de- development plan, Thailand has quite a large share of energy from fossil fuel, from gas, from coal, from oil. How can we transit our energy source towards solar energy? Well, actually, the technology is uh, is quite as one right now, and uh, the solar energy actually has some drawback. Like uh, they they are not as stable as fossil fuel source because uh, of the weather and also not available at night. So in the PDP, they said that uh, in order to maintain the stability, they need fossil fuel. But actually, there are more things that uh, can add to the solar energy to make it more stable, like uh, doing some energy storage, changing the source of electricity, like a switch the fossil to the back up to more adaptable and able to like a back up solar in the unstable time or at night. Mm-hmm. So uh, if they have the political will, they have the will to shift toward the renewable energy, there, there is a way in to set this in PDP, but uh, we didn't see that right now. That is Unlock the Science reporter Prat Ruti Wanarom talking to Thirapong Sang Lab Dorengit, Urban Revolution Coordinator of Greenpeace Thailand. We will take a short break now. You are listening to Unlock the Science on Chula Radio Plus. According to the latest report on solar photovoltaic system, or solar PV, a technology to turn sunlight into electricity by the Paris-based intergovernmental organization, International Energy Agency, Power generation from solar PV in 2020 was estimated to have increased by 23% from a year earlier. However, the technology still accounts for only 3% of global electricity production. Although investment in solar PV has continued to grow, it is not expanding fast enough to keep up with the ambitious net zero emission target, which governments and companies around the world aim to achieve by the year 2050. Actually, the price of solar PV installation and investment has become cheaper and more competitive, but solar PV is still not widely applied in hot tropical countries. This is partly because of its technological limitations that solar panels will have lower efficiency when operating under high temperature. The size of solar PV panels is also very large. Therefore, it needs to be installed over rooftop or on large plots of land in solar farms. 
However, a researcher team at Metallurgy and Material Science Research Institute of Jilalongkorn University has tried to develop a new type of solar PV, known as perovskite solar cells, in tackling the limitations of traditional solar panels. Unlike traditional cells that are made from silicon, perovskite solar cells are based on a new class of semiconductors, which are organic and inorganic hybrid halide perovskites. Perovskite itself is a crystal structure. The researcher team explained that perovskite solar cells have similar efficiency compared to silicon cells. But this new type of solar cells can operate much better in hot condition, as it can function perfectly even the temperature of the panels reach up to 65 degrees Celsius. And due to its very thin and flexible materials, perovskite solar cells can be applied with the making of various kinds of products, such as watches, hats, or even shirts. The production of these solar cells is also believed to involve lower costs than the traditional silicon cells, and its manufacturing can be made quicker. One of the properties that makes its manufacturing costing low investment is that perovskite is a high defect tolerant material, meaning even the cells are produced with defects, they can still be efficient in generating electricity. The key issue of perovskite cells now is its stability. The research at j u l a l o n g o n University aims to tackle this stability issue. Perovskite cells currently remain on the research and development stage in many countries around the world. In order to learn more about this technology, a l o c k the science reporter Prat r u t i w a n a r o m talks to Dr. Rong Rong j i a t a r e n a researcher behind the development of perovskite solar cells at the Metallurgy and Material Science Research Institute of j u l a l o n g o n University. Okay, for the first question, what exactly is a p e r o s k y t e solar cell, and how it is it different from uh, the typical type of solar cell? Okay, so p e r o s k y t e is a name is of a crystal structure which uh, traditionally composed of um, uh, organic cation in the middle. That is surrounded by the hexagonal lead halide structure. Uh, I mean, originally p e r o v s k y is named after uh, this, uh, uh, Nis- Nis- Nikola p e r o v s k y and it's, it was originally found in like um, p e r o v s k y oxide. But in this case, um, people discovered that when you um, you know create this structure with halide, you can get a materials that can convert light to electricity that has such a wide range of band gap. And and with the perovskite, perovskite usually has a structure of like a A B X 3 so you know you can change A. Uh, the the A one is usually an organic cation, but sometimes people uh, people replace it or like add an inorganic materials in there. So this is an one way to tune the band gap. Or sometimes you can change B, which is usually a lead, like a lead. Sometimes people um. Combine it with a uh, tin or something else to make it environmentally friendly. So y- you can play around with it. I-, I would say that there are quite a few difference that you can find uh, between perovskite and the p- uh, typical PV. So one thing is, as I mentioned before, the band gap is highly tunable. Not sure how you are familiar with the band gap. Band gap is pretty much tells you how wide the light, or I guess. How much energy of the light that you need to convert, you know, electron in the uh, valence band to conduction band, meaning that you need at the least amount of energy to excite and uh, create electricity. Or in a reverse way, you can view that the perovskite can have very colorful appearance because of this, mm-hmm. because you can tune the band gap from, you know, like. Uh, Below UV to sometimes red, so you can also make a very colorful perovskite uh, solar cell out of it. Another thing is that the perovskite is a very tor- uh, it's a very high defect tolerant materials, meaning that even if you fabricate it via solution process, and if you have like tons of defects, you can still get energy out of it. So it's very economically feasible or Um, uh, technology. 
Mm-hmm. Another thing, very big important, uh, very big difference is that you um, perovskite can do the same function with super thin materials. Perovskite needs only 500 nanometer thick of the active material to convert light to electricity. But compare with like a thin, other thin film like a cattail, that you need twice thicker. Or compare with silicon, you need 300 times thicker silicon mm. to convert the light to electricity. So, uh, yeah, that, that also brings to why perovskite can be cheap, can be lightweight. It can be used in any different uh, applications. Another thing that people don't usually mention would be the temperature coefficient of perovskite, meaning that imagine right now our current technology in the market, we use silicon, right? Yeah. And, and in Thailand, it's very hot country. Mm-hmm. So when you put silicon in a field, the temperature can get up to like 65 degrees Celsius. Mm-hmm. And the, usually the, the performance would drop about 15%. But for perovskite, it has very high temperature coefficient, meaning that even if the temperature gets up to 65 degrees C, the performance will drop less than 5%. So we can say that uh, the perovskite solar cell is cheaper yep. and easier to, to produce. Is that correct? Yeah, very fast. And how about the solar energy uh, efficiency of this, oh, okay. uh, of this solar cell? So, so the efficiency of perovskite, yeah. you, you, there are two ways to think about it. Mm-hmm. First, you think of it only perovskite itself. Mm-hmm. People usually refer to it as like a single junction. So the, the efficiency is very comparable to silicon. This one may be 25.6% and silicon is 26 point something. So it's very comparable, mm-hmm. but cheaper. I but when, when, when another metric is that people tend to put... Um, so two solar cells together, it doesn't have to be the same technology. Say um, you have silicon and you want to boost its performance, you can put perovskite on top of silicon to, to uh, you know, convert energy from a wider range of a light spectrum. And then you can boost the efficiency up to like 29%, mm. for example, mm-hmm. like uh, in a cheap way. And how about the potential of uh, the perovskite solar cell? Mm-hmm. Um, the potential is... I would say quite high mm-hmm. because of this, you know, like a mass produce um, uh, capability and such a high performance and it's and, and how fast. If you see the slope of the solar cell development over time, you can see that the perovskite kind of like rise up very, very steeply compared to silicon. Look at the slope itself. I so I, I, I would imagine that soon perovskite would surpass silicon. Um, but one way that people really, really need to focus on is the stability because as I mentioned before, like a perovskite, mm-hmm. since it has some organics and, and the structure is not quite the same as silicon, stability is something that people need to, you know, do a research and, you know, trying to find a way mm-hmm. to, um, you know, make sure that I guess perovskite would keep within the package. Why is that? Because... I'm not sure if you remember, but perovskite do contain lead, which could be toxic to the environment. I see. So, you know, uh, in order to, you know, deploy perovskite in the field, people need to make sure that, like, perovskite would stay within the encapsulated package. So we have to make this uh, perovskite solar cell stronger and more safe. Right. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Okay. How about the... Uh, this kind of technology, uh, perovskite solar cell, can help Thailand mission to achieve the net zero emission goal. I would say that this technology can touch many different levels. Um, mm-hmm. Since it can produce very cheaply, you can, you know, mass produce it and distribute it, you know, to all around Thailand. That is the first way to, you know, make sure that people um, know what solar cell is learn how they operate and, you know, like live with it because soon we need to trans- transition into like 100% renewable, right? So I think, I think it will be one key um, factor that will help us reach there in an in a energy production scale. Yeah, it, it will get there because mm. as I know, there's so many companies producing perovskite right now. We just need to, you know, learn the behavior of it and develop together with like international partners 
um, both the sign like material side and both like um, you know like controlling side like uh, you know when when you put the solar panels in operation you need to have some electrical circuits right so we need to be prepared for to uh, for that pro to to get the maximum power out of perovskite panels so once we are ready with that then you know we can transition into like 100% renewables mm. and then we not not only that you know 100% renewable and also decentralized electricity meaning that like even if you get a blackout or like you know even if you live far away you can still get access to energy since the fate of human civilization and the future of our planet depend on our collaborative climate actions in the next two decades, humanity is now facing with the grueling challenge of keeping the global temperature from rising above 1.5 degrees Celsius as to avert the catastrophic outcomes of extreme climate. In order to accomplish this crucial climate mitigation goal, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has stressed that we have to cut greenhouse gases emission from all our activities down to net zero by mid-century. Fortunately, Dr. Rongrong pointed out that with the continuous advancement of solar cell technology, particularly the upcoming of perovskite solar cells, we shall be able to harness energy from the sun more efficiently. Therefore, Solar power will greatly bolster our efforts to decarbonize the energy sector as it can be a clean alternative source of energy to replace the polluting fossil fuels, which are the major cause of global warming. Nevertheless, Tirapong warned that the main concern is not whether we have advanced technologies to mitigate climate change, but whether governments of countries around the world have enough political wills to pursue the drastic transition of their country toward carbon neutrality. Even we already have perfect solutions for transitioning our energy sector toward clean and renewable energy. Tirapong noted that many countries, including Thailand, are still reluctant to embrace solar energy as they do not have regulations and policies to support solar investment. We already have what we need to tackle climate crisis. All we need to do is to transform our entire economic and social system to secure the safe future for the next generations, he added. A lot of science would like to thank Tira Pong Sang Lab Jarangit, Urban Revolution Coordinator of Greenpeace Thailand, and Dr. Rong Rong Jiajaran of the Metallurgy and Material Science Research Institute, Jilalongkorn University. I hope you enjoy our program. You can listen to Unlock the Science on Jula Radio Plus at FM 101.5 every Saturday from 1 p.m. to 1.30 p.m. You can also listen and follow us on our website, curadio.jula.ac.th, and our Facebook page. Our show is also accessible as podcasts, including on Apple and Spotify. See you again next Saturday. Have a nice day. Unlock the Science is edited and produced by Sinfa Tunsorawood. <laughs> 